Semiconductors truly are at the core of this digital revolution that we're seeing take place across society in front of our very eyes. From the cars that we drive to the phone or laptop that you might be watching this video on, semiconductors are essential to each and every one of our digitally integrated activities. You might be wondering, what are semiconductors? What are they so important for? And what are some companies that can provide some exposure to this semiconductor trend? In today's video, we're going to answer all of these questions and make sure you stay until the end because we're going to discuss the semiconductor shortage and how it's been playing out over these past couple of years. If you do enjoy this video, welcome. Make sure you've subscribed and turn your bell notifications on. We make daily videos each and every day and we'd love to have you join the community. Before we talk about five key ASX semiconductor companies that have the opportunity to continue to scale with this digital revolution, I thought it makes sense for us to have a bit of a start with a step back, thinking about the semiconductor industry and what semiconductors actually are. So at their core, semiconductors are the computer chips. They're chips that are a series of electronic circuits printed onto a conducting material. Conventionally, this is silicon, and they are the physical blocks to make computers, but also to run software on. I'm sure you all might be familiar with the visual of a semiconductor computer chip like the one on the right, but there's actually a myriad of different types of semiconductors. There's quite a broad base banner that includes a range of different components. It is worth noting as well that semiconductors have traditionally long lead times due to the complex technology, and there is an increasing use case of different types of semiconductors as technology becomes more and more complex, and as the world we live in becomes more and more digitally integrated. Now, not every component of the semiconductor supply chain is made equal. It is worth noting that at the different ends of them, there are different types of companies. On one end, in the early stage, you have the designers, which are called the fabulous companies. These are fabulous designers, which are making the IP and developing the designs for the actual semiconductors themselves. They develop the technology. Then there are manufacturers on the other side called the foundries who are implementing fabulous design technology into customers' products and developing customers' products for them. So big foundries around the world that you might be familiar with include Taiwan Semiconductor, and they will produce a range of products for companies like Apple, or Panasonic or any of these other types of companies. And then there are integrated device manufacturers. They actually do both sides of this chain. They design as well as manufacture chips. And these include leading global companies that you might be familiar with like Intel or Samsung who have both foundries in-house as well as of course fabulous design components as well. As we dive into today's video, we'll be exploring a range of different ASX semiconductor companies. They cover a broad range of components from AI and neuromorphic processing to memory technologies, semiconductor design and manufacturing equipment, as well as quantum computing. It's a fascinating discussion. I'd love to know your thoughts on it all as well. So drop in a comment below what you think about the semiconductor space and which companies have caught your eye with this digital transition that's just starting to pick up pace moving forward. Just a standard reminder as well, as you know, I'm just a bloke on the internet who loves talking about stocks. I'm definitely not a financial advisor. Nothing we talk about is financial advice and the stocks are not buy recommendations. These are hopefully just a few interesting companies that might be interesting for you to add to your watch list and are hopefully is a good starting spot for you to go away and do your own research from. And so stock number one is Weebit Nano. ASX WBT are playing in the next generation memory space. They're developing re-RAM memory. RERAM memory is hoping to sit in this sweet spot because at the moment we've got a range of incumbent memory technologies, but there are capacity constraints, particularly for the incumbent flash memory technology. As a result of that, flash memory it really becomes inefficient, moving below into the smaller geometries below that 40 nanometer mark. And of course, as we move into a society that's becoming more and more complex and digitally integrated, these technologies are becoming smaller and smaller. And so a next generation memory technology is sought, and this is where Weebit is hoping their RAM technology can fill the void. We bit of focusing initially on the embedded memory market, but they are also looking to develop a solution for the discrete market in years to come. And so they've got that two pronged offering. They've signed their first commercial deal with Skywater. This is a significant agreement. Of course, the first validation of the product with a commercial deal is major. They're now doing the technology transfer and are working towards qualification over this next year as well. And from there, they're also looking at signing other commercial agreements as they continue to move forward and scale. Interestingly, Weebit's reram uses silicon oxide. This is significant because it makes it easier to tool, a faster process as well, and of course it's a fab-friendly material. Along with that, ASXWBT have a world-class leadership team. 
And as noted, Weebit Nano's commercialization is just beginning to scale. They finished their earliest R&D phase, and now it's going to be interesting to see where they move forward to in the years to come. As you'll note today, we're looking into a range of different companies. It's going to be a high level overview. Hopefully it is that interesting starting spot for your research. But if you did want some further insights or to develop a further understanding about these companies, we've looked into most of these companies for deep dives or with CEO interviews on the channel. So you can check those out after this video. Up next and following sequentially on with Weebit is 4DS Memory. They're often discussed quite similarly as well because both of them are developing out reram memory technology. 4DS is an interface switching reram, which is an area based memory, so it's slightly different to Weebit's reram. And interestingly, they've got a joint development agreement, which has gone for a number of years and it's just recently been renewed as well for 2022 with a subsidiary of Western Digital, obviously one of the largest companies in the world in the space. They also have an R&D collaboration with IMEC, which is the number one semiconductor independent development company. And they do have a robust patent portfolio with over 30 patents. They are targeting the storage class memory space. At the moment, we've got DRAM and NAND flash. DRAM, that working memory, which is volatile, and then NAND flash, which is a non-volatile memory, but obviously it's significantly slower than DRAM. And 4DS memory are hoping to develop out their RAM, which can sit in between those, slightly edging towards that DRAM side of the spectrum. It is worth noting as well that 4DS memory did provide a technical update over this past period that saw a significant sell-off in their share price. They came across some potential degradation in endurance with some of the testing. So they're going back and doing some further testing now. And of course, there was some uncertainties about what this meant for the 4DS memory story in the near term. It's going to be interesting to see how this story evolves moving forward from here. And just building on that 4DS discussion, they are seeking a capital exit with a sale or an acquisition once the technology is developed, which is quite different in contrast to some of the other companies that we'll talk about today, many of whom are looking towards commercialization of their technology and bringing this to market themselves in-house. Company number three, Archer Materials. ASX AXE is actually the only company providing quantum computing exposure on the ASX at this current time. They've developed their flagship 12CQ chip. This is still in the early development stages, but there's a lot of excitement surrounding it. What it's aiming to do is to facilitate quantum computing at room temperature on mobile devices, which for anyone who's familiar with quantum computing, if they can achieve what is often considered the holy grail in this space, that of course would be significant. They're also developing a lab on a chip biochip, which is in the early R&D phase, but they've had some promising results over this past period with a range of announcements as well. And they've got tier one facilities, people, IP to do their work at. They recently have sold off their mineral tenements too. So they're now able to be completely focused as a pure play deep technology semiconductor company. They're going to be very interesting to see where Archer Materials heads from here. They're trading in around the $300 million market cap level. They did have a significant uplift last year with a spike, but they've started to trend back towards this level now. And of course, they're playing right on the frontier of some of these next generation deep technology space. So this coming decade will be quite interesting for ASX AXE. The next company on the list is Revasum. We often talk on the channel about picks and shovels businesses. As the old quote goes, in the gold rush, it wasn't those who were prospecting and digging for gold who made all the money. It was those who were selling the picks and shovels to those prospectors. And so Revasum is a company really playing in that picks and shovels type business who are able to get exposure to the semiconductor trend by providing design and manufacturing equipment for the semiconductor space. They have fully automated single wafer grinding and polishing solutions. They design and manufacture this capital equipment and they're focusing on the silicon carbide market, SIC, at wafer sizes in and around or below the 200 millimeter mark. What's interesting is this SIC technology enhances EV performance. So it's playing right on the frontier of a space that we know is only going to continue to expand as the electric vehicle adoption picks up pace. And SIC semiconductors do have a range of benefits over traditional SI devices or silicon devices as well. I think what was interesting about Revasum is they're trading in and around. They've just poked their head above the $100 million market cap size recently, but they've provided a forecast for their FY22 total revenue, which was above $25 million revenue in that 25 to $35 million forecasted range. Now, even after their previous uplift to the $100 million mark, that's only trading at four times or three times sales, depending where they end up landing. So three to four times sales isn't a crazy valuation, particularly when you're having growth rates of 50, 60, 70 and above percent, depending on where they do land on this scale into FY22. And then stock number five, we wouldn't be talking about semiconductors on the ASX unless we discussed Brainchip. ASX BRN has truly broken out for the start of 2022 as one of the leading lights in the semiconductor space on the exchange. 
Akita is currently the world's only commercially available neuromorphic processor. It's a top of class technology that's first in class and best in class. And at its core, Akita aims to facilitate AI processing at the edge. It's ultra low power, it's got high performance processing, and it leverages spiking neural networks. So as a result of this, it's only trying to process anomalies or spikes. And there's a range of these benefits that flow out of it as a result. The focus for Brainchip in terms of their scale objectives is IP licensing. They've recently brought on and welcomed their new CEO, Sean Hare, who's garnering a lot of excitement about the BRN story. And of course, there was some discussions about Mercedes, who so will be looking to implement Akita in their new prototype EV vehicle as well. There definitely is a wave of excitement flowing through for many of the semiconductors on the ASX. As investors look forward towards this digital revolution and really trying to get some insights into some companies that may be able to provide exposure if they're successfully able to implement, develop, and then execute on their technologies. Before we dive into the semiconductor shortage and how that's played out, if you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Make sure you've subscribed and turned your bell notifications on as well. Drop in a comment and let us know your thoughts. So the semiconductor shortage. We know that semiconductors are a cyclical industry. Obviously as demand ebbs and flows, there's going to be investment at different types of periods in the cycle, normally clustered as we've seen recently, but that's later on in this discussion. What we had really is that initial signal was the virus and the lockdowns. In 2020, I'm sure everybody remembers, we were all living at home, stuck indoors. There was a significant reliance and increase in terms of technologies that we were using at home. People were playing more video games, watching more TV and Netflix. With the work from home, maybe you had an extra monitor at home, you had brought your work laptop home, or maybe you were studying online as well. So virus caused demand spikes with an increased digital adoption. People bought more devices and companies were building more technological infrastructure. So demand increases. But interestingly, in terms of supply in the earlier stages, of course, there was concerns about what was going to be happening to the markets with the lockdowns. Were we moving into a lower or a no growth environment? So some certain sectors actually reduced the amount of orders that they put out. The automaker one was the most significant, of course. And so the automakers actually ordered fewer chips initially. These chips were bought by electronic companies, but then we saw the demand flowing through in the subsequent months months after that. This led to a semiconductor shortage, which is still not yet to be resolved, but we're seeing significant investment from a range of these leading fabs, so really starting with Taiwan Semiconductor, but many of these other companies around the world. So of course, as supply comes online, that's going to help ease this semiconductor shortage and bottleneck, but that's really where we've ended up today. Of course, really building on top of that, finally, there has been an increased focus on localization of supply chains to build in resilience into these supply chains. And this, of course, is going to have a range of effects, particularly because a lot of the fabrication at the moment is clustered around Asia and other key hubs. So it's going to be interesting to see how this situation develops and unfolds. Very keen to know your thoughts on it all. Drop in a comment below. Hope you enjoyed this video. Semiconductors are a critical component of this digital transition. It's going to be very fascinating to see what lies up ahead for the industry. Thank you for joining us. For now, stay well and happy investing.